4,000 meters above sea level, on the north face of Chimborazo, the legendary volcano that in 1802 proved an insurmountable challenge for Alexander von Humboldt. Mountain guide Juliana Garcia wants to take us to the summit. Our team is struggling with the thin air at this altitude, and we still have hours of ascent ahead of us. We're following the route taken two centuries ago by the famous explorer and naturalist. I'm really passionate about climbing and I'm really passionate about being in the mountain. So, of course, 200 years ago, if someone arrived here and discovered this area and is like, of course you fall in love with the, with the mountain. I can see how visionary he was, thinking how he can get to the top. If you imagine, he didn't know how high it is. And just that feeling of adventure to go up and try to measure the mountain and try to, to be in a place that nobody been before. As we follow in the footsteps of Alexander von Humboldt, our expedition will take us halfway across South America. Our journey begins here in Ecuador, in one of the world's highest capital cities. For Humboldt, Quito was the window on the heavens. He and his companions set up a base in the Spanish colonial town. Their objective, to explore the region and document everything they encountered along the way. The basement of Ecuador's National Archives houses the priceless findings of their research trip. The maps, correspondence, and drawings produced by Humboldt and stored here amount to over 4,000 pages. Historian and Humboldt expert Segundo Moreno Yanes has examined all the documents. One enormously important item is the passport issued to Humboldt by the Spanish government on May 7, 1799. The aim was for him to, quote, continue studying the mines and make collections, observations, and discoveries useful for the advancement of the natural sciences. The passport gave Humboldt license to roam as he pleased through Spain's colonial territories, an extraordinary privilege for the time, and one that he made maximum use of. In the space of five years, he traveled from Venezuela to Cuba, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, then on to Mexico, exploring, collecting, and measuring everything he came across. Humboldt's holistic approach to research combined precise data gathering with personal observations made during his journey. He bridged the boundaries of scientific disciplines. Humboldt came to the Americas to understand how all the forces of nature are intertwined and interconnected. He was accompanied on his mission by his friend, the botanist Aimé Bonplan. The two men were awed by Chimborazo, the inactive volcano which at the time was considered the world's highest mountain. Humboldt resolved to reach its summit. Go up the mountain? That's not something people do here normally. At most, maybe bring up luggage for visitors, but no one goes up the mountain of their own accord. Chimborazo can't be climbed by anyone who is bad or has failings. It can only be climbed by people who are healthy, who are well-fed and who are on good terms with the Lord. 
If you've done something bad in your life, you won't make it. If you try, you'll end up blind, or crazy, or dead. That's because Chimborazo is sacred. Still, Humboldt was determined to climb the Colossus. Towering 6,300 meters above sea level, it was long considered unconquerable. Today, Chimborazo attracts mountain climbers from across the world. Many of them are escorted by Latin America's first internationally licensed female mountain guide, Juliana Garcia. I remember one day I came and was like nobody there. And I had clients with me and I was like, Okay, scary. like here we are, right? This is a real thing. It's you and uh, you just need to trust yourself and uh, your abilities and capacities and okay, keep going. The only thing that I did by myself is following my, my heart to be passionate about mountains and climbing. And because of that, now I'm in the point that, okay, I can inspire more people uh, to do the same. But uh, I never thought that I'm going to become the first female mountain guide here in South America and, and, and be like that. But now it's part of, part of me. <laughs> Our respect for Humboldt's scientific curiosity grows as we approach the glacier. It's our first time at this kind of altitude. As we continue our ascent of Chimborazo, we can also see distinct changes in the vegetation. We are arriving to a point where the transitions with vegetation, now you can see lichens, but they are disappearing as soon as we go high up. The glacier is near, so just some plants can survive up here. No many, and in just a few meters from down below, two, three hundred meters is a big change. Vegetation is gonna disappear in the next hundred meters, and the glacier starts, so it's the desert in this area they cannot survive. There's not enough oxygen for them to, to, to be alive up here. The trek from Quito up Chimborazo was, Humboldt wrote, like a botanical journey from the equator to the poles. Down in the valleys, he saw tropical plants. And further up the mountain, vegetation similar to that in Northern Europe. As the explorer looked down on the mountain ranges below him, he perceived the world with different eyes. Later, Humboldt painted a now famous cross-section of Chimborazo, illustrating the different vegetation and climate zones. It demonstrated the relationship between plant life and altitude and climate in patterns repeated across the planet. The Chimborazo map was a striking illustration of the complex interconnectedness of the natural world. Humboldt was forced to abandon his expedition a few hundred meters short of the summit of Chimborazo, his way blocked by an impassable ravine. But he had climbed higher than anyone before him, and his world fame was guaranteed. <laughs> 